Hey, good afternoon, and thanks for inviting us to uh, speak at the Optical Communications Workshop. Uh, we're uh, excited to present optical uh, inter-satellite links for the space web. My name's uh, Dave Roby, and I'm here with my friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Aaron Freeman. Hey, Aaron, uh, we started on this thing more than three years ago. How did we get started? Uh, it was quarter four, 2017. You and I submitted an internal research and development funding request to really do a hardware demonstration or proof of concept, and, and boy, that's really spiraled out of control. And we're now set up, as a result of that, getting ready for a two-satellite launch to truly demonstrate it in field. Yeah, a little bit about the mission overview. Um, again, uh, opportunity to fly on the Landsat uh, 9 mission. Very exciting to be able to do a ride share with our NASA partners. But overall, we developed a uh, the Lynx uh, 12U mission scheduled for launch in uh, March of 2021. It's got two payloads, infrared imager, the infrared imagers are uh, about 11 meter GSD. Uh, again, once we separate the spacecraft, we'll have about 18 degrees of parallax, and we're going to be able to raise uh, the space TRL level on the focal plane to about uh, TRL 6. The telescope itself is already a TRL 9. And finally, the key to this discussion is all about our optical communication links. We'll talk uh, lots more about it, but big picture, we really want to use the optical communication links to develop that space web and be able to drive uh, space collections and space latencies down to near zero. Aaron, why don't you give us a little bit of an overview of the CubeSat OV-1? Yeah, absolutely. So as Dave mentioned, we're going to be launching in uh, March of 2021. The baseline altitude that we'll be at is 550 kilometers. It will be in a sun-synchronous orbit. Now, as Dave mentioned, we're a rideshare on Landsat 9. Uh, what that means is we get dropped off where they put us, uh, meaning that the two satellites will not be 2,400 kilometers apart initially, and we'll have to use differential drag as well as whatever residual delta V we get uh, after being ejected from the S-Marine. We're expecting that to take about one month to complete the separation activity, at which point we'll start doing some inter-satellite link activities. So some of the tests, of course, are uh, pointing acquisition tracking, data rate over range, and so forth. And then in the limiting case, uh, with, if we have a collaborative, uh, collaborative, collaborative partner for a ground link terminal, we'd like to do some downlink demonstrations as well. So getting into a little bit of the hardware, we're going to go deep dive on the laser comm terminal itself, including the optics. But before we get started, I want to show you a little bit of an orientation slide. So here is a couple different views of the CAD model for the cube, the 12U CubeSat. I'm actually going to start in the bottom right. That silver circle with the squ uh, black square around it is the optical axis of the laser comm terminal itself. Going to the center bottom view, you can see a black circle. That's the optical axis of the infrared camera that Dave mentioned. And below that in the same view is actually the back of the laser comm terminal, including the transmit receiver and so forth. Now there's better views on it later, but I want you oriented on what the satellites uh, uh, looks like on the inside. On the top center graphic, left side, there's a stack of yellow rectangular shapes. That's the electronics chassis for the laser comm terminal. Dave, why don't you go into a little bit of detail about the TRL and our mass budget? Yeah, so we've been developing not only the payloads, but the uh, 12U bus, and specifically to be able to do just this, increase the TRL of uh, payloads at relatively low cost. Again, you can see lots of high TRL components on there from great suppliers like InnoFlight, Eagle Pitcher, and uh, Blue Canyon. From the other perspective, with respect to the payloads, and with respect to harnesses, and with respect to payload interface modules, those are TRL-6. Those are the components that we want to get some space flight time on and develop some heritage. So good solid bus, flying some new payload, flying some new payloads. Overall, total uh, mass of the bus is uh, just under 30 kilograms. So one of the key things that we're looking for here is not just to proliferate low Earth orbit with CubeSats, but really to have a solution that meets a lot of different spacecraft vendors, different mission profiles, different altitudes, meaning orbital altitudes, etc. cetera. Um, really the goal, if I had to sum it up, would be to develop a bus agnostic laser comm architecture. We really feel we've done that with one exception, which would be the beam pointing device, or the coarse pointing assembly as it's often referred to as. So that aside, being the one mission-specific adapt mission adaptation, let's talk about the other modular and uh, uh, scalable parts of this laser comm terminal that really can meet different mission spaces. So on the bottom right, you can see uh, kind of the isolated view extracted from the CubeSat of the laser comm terminal, including the beam expander. 
Uh, this view also shows a star tracker, which we're launching with attached to the Lasercom uh, optical axis for better accuracy in terms of our navigation solution. Uh, that doesn't have to be there in different missions, uh, mission contexts. Uh, however, anytime you're integrating a payload into a satellite, you have to be very careful, of course, to make sure that your interfaces match the host vehicle. So the big ones, obviously, are your mechanical interfaces, your electrical, and then your data interfaces, which sometimes get interchanged. But nonetheless, what we're showing here, this entire payload package, is approximately 3U, using the CubeSat definition of the term U. Um, and it includes the laser, the electronics, the amplifiers, the free space optical portion, the beam expander telescope, and of, of course in this view it has a star tracker which doesn't necessarily have to be there in a larger satellite concept. Um, the, uh, the data protocols are RS-422 Ethernet and then of course we use 28 volt kind of quote unquote house power. So we feel with those offerings and a simplified mechanical interface this truly can be used on a variety of different mission uh, including space vehicles now let's go ahead and transition and talk about use in different altitudes at different cross ranges. So obviously as part of the uh, cross-link demonstration you have to make sure your link budget closes and that's typically at the first order a combination of aperture size and laser power. So uh, aperture size as we mentioned is, is one of the bus or excuse me mission specific adaptations or could be. The other part of this would be a variable laser output power. The way we've handled that to ensure that we have a good solution for a variety of different mission scenarios is to have a variable laser amplifier mechanical design. What that means is we have uh, developed a solution that has three different stage options, so one, two, or three stages to get either 1.5, approximately 8, or 35 watts of laser power. That isn't special. What's special is the fact that we did it in a very compact mechanical form factor where the swap impact, the size, weight, and power impact of going from one, two, or three stages in a mechanical sense is about one and a half centimeters of additional depth to that yellow electronic stack that I pointed out earlier. Now, of course, to get from 1.5 to 8 and 35 watts, there's more electrical power required, but uh, from a mechanical standpoint, this is a very minimal swap impact. Going on to the optical architecture in particular, uh, what you see here is kind of a traditional erbium dope fiber amplifier laser solution going into free space optics. And what we have on the right hand side is uh, the, schematic of, uh, the schematic of the laser architecture and then what the resultant hardware ended up looking like. But let's focus on the architecture for just a second. Go on to the next slide, please. So one of the key features here, if you look into the top left, is what we're referring to as wavelength diversity. Every satellite or every laser comm terminal is going to be launched with a variety of uh, seed laser wavelengths. In our case, for these two satellites, we're using both 1550 and 1560. Now the idea there is that each terminal would be designated to be transmit on 1560 or 1550 so that we minimize the crosstalk in, turn, uh, in the internal receiver of the two satellites. So the, the idea of using a slightly different transmit wavelength on each satellite supports the idea of uh, a common aperture solution, which therefore has a very positive swap impact, thus looking back at our uh, bus agnostic solution. So going through the amplifier, uh, variety of bandpass filters and so forth into the free space optical portion. You see what's HWP, of course, stands for half wave plate. That's to orient the transmit uh, polarization to reflect off that polarization beam splitter shown there in kind of the center uh, portion of the schematic. And then a quarter wave plate before the, the, uh, the transmit telescope to ensure that we don't have any orientation matching issues between the two terminals. So going back short, uh, briefly to the two wavelength solution, in addition to supporting isolation between the two terminals, it also serves as a, a kind of a basic redundancy strategy. So for example, if the satellite designated as Transmit 1550 had a seed failure, uh, through some collaborative radio communication or RF comms, we could get both satellites to switch their primary and therefore the mission can continue. Hey, additionally, by giving those 1550 and 1560, we really removed the AB terminal matching that is required on a lot of optical com communication terminals. So this allows us to be able to connect not only to your partner satellite, but to any other satellite. Very good. Now looking a little more closely into the optical layout, what you can see here on the top right 
and the bottom right are different views of the, uh, the ZMAX model. So in terms of the beam expander, we're gonna, we're gonna go from uh, the receive side, basically. So photons entering the telescope. So where it's uh, the rays are colored blue, you can see a uh, beam expander telescope. This is a 12X confocal paraboloid set. Uh, going into uh, the, if you look at the bottom, you can see the steering mirror. The steering mirror is of course used for a combination of coarse pointing as well as jitter suppression. And then uh, that blue set of rays goes back into the transmitter. So I understand I'm saying this backwards, but I'm just moving left to right. Uh, as, the, as you go past the polarizing beam splitter there, you enter into the receive set of this, uh, of this optical layout, which is shown in green. So the receiver basically has a bandpass filter to prevent the transmit light from coming in, as well as a lens, then the photodiode. Uh, the beam splitter that's going from green to red is a 1090 splitter to ensure that most of the energy goes into the receive side and a small portion goes into what we're referring to as our acquisition camera. The acquisition camera is what originally finds the beam and then maintains track. The output of the acquisition camera is processed and fed into the steering mirror to ensure that we always maintain a good signal on the photodiode. So, this is the hardware realization of the slide that you just saw, as shown from CAD. Everything's labeled here, and I want to just point out a few things before we move on. The 12X confocal beam expander, again, having a common transmit uh, receive aperture truly pushes our swap impact down, again, pushing to having a bus agnostic solution here. Uh, one other item, item four, is a diverging assembly, which spoils the beam and increases the divergence temporarily and we'll go into a little bit of detail later on when we use that. It's basically used for initial acquisition to make it easier for the two satellites to find themselves. Then once we have positive lock between the two satellites, we'll remove that to increase the fluence and really drive up our uh, communication capability by increasing the signal to noise ratio. So one of the key features here, I've kind of touched on it sh uh, briefly, is the uh, acquisition tracking and pointing. So being 2,000 kilometers apart and looking for a 30 microradian beam is very, very challenging. Uh, as part of our technology readiness level maturation activity over the past few years, we wanted to come up with a way to demonstrate these algorithms on Earth. Now this isn't trivial because we're certainly not going to stand 2,000 kilometers apart with a vacuum and, and demonstrate them. So what we've done here is in a laboratory environment done our very best to simulate what it will look and feel like on orbit. You can see in the figure there's laser comm terminals one and two passing data left and right to each other simultaneously, so really demonstrating that uh, common uh, transmit receive capability. Each of those breadboard terminals has a steering mirror capability like we discussed earlier. But then at the top of the photo you can see that the one labeled error insertion fast steering mirror or FSM. That one is basically just imparting line of sight errors as well as residual jitter onto this uh, onto the, the communication path and the intent is to have the flight steering mirrors reject that jitter, reject those line of sight errors and really push for what are, you know, we'll consider error-free communication, which you can see in the eye diagram in the top right. Now, I understand this isn't at 2,000 kilometers. There's other things that'll uh, happen here, but at a minimum, we're truly demonstrating the feasibility of our acquisition tracking and pointing algorithms as best we can in a terrestrial environment. So going back a little bit to our divergence scheme, the intent here is to have a beaconless laser comm terminal. So the idea is putting that diverging assembly in place to spoil the beam or increase the divergence, and this really relieves a lot of pressure in terms of finding the other satellites. It basically makes it easier for the initial acquisition process to occur. Once initial acquisition occurs, the core steering mirror will center the beam onto uh, what is known as the line of sight of the photodiode, and then the diverging assembly will be removed, at which points the, the divergence goes down and the fluence goes up, and our signal to noise ratio is increased to again reach towards hopefully bit error rate uh, free communication. This figure here shows what it looks like after initial acquisition is achieved. Uh, the blue kind of triangular cone there is supposed to be the diverge beam and the red one is after the divergence assembly is removed and the fluence is increased. So while not the primary point of this, we want to touch briefly on the IR imager. Dave, would you mind? 
Yeah, exactly. Uh, just to kind of conclude, uh, we also have a couple of cameras. Uh, we've got uh, some uh, spectral uh, diversity here. One of them is centered on about 1.2 microns, and the other uh, camera on the other spacecraft about 1.7 microns. Again, uh, the big picture here is that we really wanted to have a SWIR camera in space that gives us some multispectral binocular uh, vision. That'll support a bunch of different missions there. Uh, and also it generates some data to be able to transmit using our laser comm terminals. In conclusion, uh, bus agnostic, uh, Leo to Leo, Leo to Geo, and also the capability to go to ground. Uh, second, uh, lots of high TRL uh, components on the spacecraft and the ability to get flight uh, heritage and, and proven uh, hardware on the laser comm terminals. So overall, we're really excited about uh, finishing up. Uh, we're in the build phase and it is hectic, but we're finishing that up at this point in time and getting ready for PSR at the end of the review, uh, at the end of the year, and then heading on out to the uh, launch site uh, early in the uh, first quarter, first uh, calendar quarter of uh, 2021. Thanks, and we look forward to hearing from you if you have any questions.